Hey. Sorry. So um, how much does the audience, I want to ask, how much do you know about Quixie and Spindle? Very little. Okay. That's a good place to start. Yeah. So basically, um, I was wondering if um, Pat and then Tomar, if you could basically give like a quick overview of what your companies do. All right. So I'm Pat. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me here, um, Spark Labs and everyone here. It's an honor. I've had a great uh, time in Seoul so far. So thank you. Um, so I was previously at Microsoft, and I was focused there on uh, their social search initiative. So at Microsoft, uh, you know, we were focused on helping people discover web links that were shared through Twitter and Facebook. And you know, our insight was the actual posts themselves, the Twitter you know, tweets and the Facebook posts, that those were uh, interesting and worth servicing on their own. And so when we started the company, there really was no good way to determine um, the relevance of a piece of social content. And so we've spent the past two and a half years building a new search technology that tries to determine how interesting, uh, timely, relevant an actual tweet or Facebook post is to uh, a person at a certain time and place. So we built an iOS application that leverages that technology, uh, and it tries to answer the question, what's happening nearby right now? And so the premise is, uh, every day you walk past countless businesses and organizations that are producing really interesting content on Twitter and Facebook, and yet you're missing out on all of that. And so by opening up the app, it goes out, it finds you know, all the businesses around you, it finds their official accounts on Twitter and Facebook, and then it analyzes, um, it uses our search technology to analyze their posts in real time and try to find the most interesting updates. So it could be from a restaurant, it could be from a you know, store, uh, you know, we try to map that to your interests. So it's a uh, it's a new way to discover what's happening. So. Intor. Great. So I guess with uh, with Quixie, really, it all started with the fact that um, well, we believe that the same web that everyone here has been using the last 15 years has basically changed. Uh, not just changed. I mean, we believe it's basically dead. Right. You no longer go to sites that are just HTML, static sites linked together. And somewhere, somewhere in the last 10 years or so, something kind of miraculous happened. Um, you know, the internet got strong, got powerful. It's doing what it never was meant to do. And in fact, you know, we're running things like, you know, HTML, when we're running things like JavaScript on top of it, Ajax on top of it, to make up for the fact that it wasn't as powerful originally, right? And we run a lot of things on the server side, right? We run a lot of computation, a lot of technology. And we call these things apps. So today we live in the world of apps, right? We, we say that the technology in our phone, these little bite-sized computation pieces, are known as apps. And we say that our websites are more powerful than ever. We log in, they can compute, they can you know, do analysis, and we call them web apps. Uh, Quixie was really founded in the idea that because the web is no longer a series of you know, simple HTML pages with links, but actually a complex universe of computation, there needs to be someone who re-architects it, that makes sense of the new web, and by doing so, actually helps users discover not just content, but functionality, right? You know, if I have a app that I can click a button and know a taxi is coming to me, and nowhere does it say that this button is for how long it will take the taxi to arrive, how can I discover that button, right? How do I discover functionality? You know, at Quixie, we call that the functional web, the web of all the world's functionalities that have been created around us. And what we do is build functional search, the ability to actually go and discover those functionalities. Uh, today, we've been around for over three years. We've raised about $24 million. Uh, we're headquartered in Mountain View, California. And what we do is we power search for many of the world's companies, device manufacturers, carriers, uh, third-party discovery engines, uh, other app discovery engines, and work really diligently to make sure that users have a better discovery experience. And so basically, um, when I was preparing this panel, um, I was trying to think of the similarities between Quixie and Spindle, because obviously, um, the Nate, both of your products are very different, because Spindle, for example, you're a location-based discovery service for consumers, and Quixie, you do a lot of back-end for different clients in terms of app search. But I mean, ultimately, it's like what you two were talking about, the data you approach, it's very dynamic, it's almost like a living thing, whereupon when people think about um, web search, I mean, it's like Tomer was saying, web data, very like static. Um, so basically, um, I want to ask, like one of the questions was basically, you know, you know, even though the two of you are um, 
you know, the searches you do, are, your products are very different. One of the things is like you're delivering very personalized search results for people. But I was wondering, um, you know, as the amount of data that's out there increases, that it's, how do you um, continue to make the search process not only more intuitive, but also deliver the best results for the particular person who's doing that search? Um, great question. So we've really focused on um, context. And so if you think about web search, um, you know, someone's sitting at their desk, someone's at work, they're at home. It's really hard to understand what their particular information need is. You know, they look for a restaurant, are they looking for directions, are they looking for reviews, are they looking for the website? And so it's very hard to infer what someone's looking for. And so our technology uh, really tries to leverage mobile devices and to understand someone's uh, particular need at any given moment. And so if you're out, you know, walking around town uh, in the morning versus in the evening, you know, we try to make uh, assumptions based on those things uh, and then, you know, apply those assumptions to, to data in real time. And, um, you know, in terms of personalization, you know, we've started there. You know, our thought is that many applications overemphasize personalization too early. Uh, especially, especially in the local discovery space. You might say you like Indian food, and then they show you 30 Indian restaurants. So our notion is, uh, you know, the first challenge is really, uh, you know, temporal interestingness. Uh, what might someone, you know, want to find at any particular moment? And then going on from there, if we can really answer those questions, we can start to map someone's own personal interests to that. So I think, you know, for us, you know, it's, it's a real-time data source. We're trying to map, I guess, real-time interest uh, based on context, location, what someone might be looking for. So it's, it's definitely a challenge. It's definitely a different approach to web search, but um, you know, that's sort of our, our shtick. So, so Tom, I remember we were talking. Um, basically, you said um, you know one of the things that you want to get around was a lot, a lot of app searches. They kind of, you know, they kind of prioritize, for example, how many times an app has been downloaded, um, and you kind of want to move away from that. So can you tell me a bit about? Sure, but yeah. actually just to kind of uh, play on what you just said, you know, let's talk about a basic search like you mentioned Indian food, right? Someone trying to find an Indian restaurant nearby. So you would expect that you would find, um, you know, apps that help you find Indian restaurants. But what if, let's say in your vicinity, a block away, there's currently a coupon for an Indian restaurant? Would you end up finding the app that shows you that, hey, you're looking for an Indian restaurant, by the way, there's a coupon for an Indian restaurant nearby? Right? I mean, how do you end up showing a user that, I know you're looking for restaurants, but how about this coupon app? Because right now, this time, this place, this search, that makes sense, right? And to do that, to your point, is gonna require more information than just, hey, what's a popular app, right? It requires a lot of data about what an app can do, about the user, about the location. Um, you know, when we look at data for apps, we don't just look at, you know, how many downloads, we don't just look at how many reviews, because uh, those are easily gamed, by the way. We look at how many articles in the web are about it over what period of time. We look at sort of what conversation, the sentiment, um, the length of the reviews, the number of words, the similarity between different reviews. We look at things such as how many different platforms does it exist on and how successful has it been on different platforms. How frequently has the information been changed, you know, et cetera. And we actually have hundreds, if not thousands, of different variables that we kind of machine learn to understand what makes sense. And I think it's an, you know, it's an ongoing challenge. You know, you really want to think about the user. At the end of the day, you know, I want a discovery mechanism where I can say, you know, gee, I, uh, how much money is in my bank account? And because I use Mint, I end up clicking on Mint, which is the first result, and I get a page that shows me how much money is in my bank account. And that's kind of the world we want to all live in. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I think from talking to the, both of the, the two of you, one of the um, kind of things that I saw was that both of you got into, I mean, you both do search in different sectors, but the reason you got into those sectors is because you thought the existing um, search engines for, or the search solutions for that, there was something broken about them or something that you just felt was not working. So I was wondering, um, Pat, can you tell me, in terms of location-based discovery, what did you want to fix going into it? Um, yeah, so we started the company back in December of 2010, um, and at that time, really, the focus was on, um, you know, place search and place recommendations. And so place search is really the, the Google experience where you type the name of a place, and really, you're just trying to, you know, you're trying to find it. It's really a, more of an entity lookup type search. Either you want to get directions, you want to find the website, things like that. And so, you know, to Tomer's point, that's, that's a very static result. It's not very interesting. It's not timely. You perform the search today, you perform it in a week, you're going to get the exact same result. Um, and then place recommendations, you know, really, that's, uh, again, pretty static. You know, if you think about Yelp, 
a, you know, a restaurant might get a one new review a month. So especially for a local, you know, you walk out, eventually you know all the places in your area. You know, the Yelp review is really not going to do anything for you. You've already been there. It's just not that interesting. And so for us, you know, the two, I guess, core problems we wanted to solve was, one, let's try to identify and enhance the voice of the business. So we thought that that was missing in existing um, search solutions or local discovery solutions. And then two, let's try to make it uh, real time. And so, uh, you know, we really tried to focus on, instead of the question, what's nearby, much more what's happening nearby right now. And so, especially for a local, we think it's a much more interesting product because you may walk by a restaurant every day, you think the restaurant's terrible, it is terrible, but maybe they're having a great band that night and you're willing to go. So in that case, that, you know, that real-time dynamic information is much more, much more compelling than either the website or the reviews or things like that. So um, you know, I think you know, as more and more services are, are producing more real-time data, that's kind of the world is moving that direction. But two and a half years ago, it certainly wasn't. So, well, Tomer, you were basically, uh, one of the things that you mentioned was that y reviews are actually pretty easily manipulated. Um, there are also a lot of other you know, things that people could basically do to game the system to have their app show up first, regardless of whether or not that app was the best. Could you tell me a bit more about that and other problems that you think existed with App Search? Sure, I mean, it's, by the way, it's really simple. Anybody here who wants to try this out, it's pretty cool. You go to any of the top apps, like the top 10 apps in any of the markets, and you try to run a crawl on the web to see um, uh, their rate of popularity, their download rate, compared to how many uh, discussions or articles have been about them. So a naturally occurring, naturally popular app starts with, a few downloads, and then a lot of discussion and news articles, and all of a sudden, this explosion of downloads. Um, an app that games the system magically has a million downloads before a single article's ever been written about it, or a single person's ever talked about it online, which kind of looks weird, right? You would think if there's a million downloads, somebody would have put a Twitter, uh, you know, tweet about it. Someone would have mentioned it on their Facebook. But you all of a sudden, you see in one day, one million downloads, and only then people are like, look, it's a popular app. It has a million downloads. So we've, we've run this, for example, across different stores, and you know, um, many of the stores have, you know, uh, you know, you see this. You see a lot of naturally occurring apps, and all of a sudden, a gamed app. Um, and that's just one of many, many different things that we do. And it's become very clear that there are easy ways to kind of game the system. For example, you know, it, uh, entire companies are built around the fact that if you, for example, give it a good review, they give you gold in a game, right? Um, you know, there are current systems now that are going to come out that say the longer the review you give it and the better sentiment analysis it runs on it, the more points it gives you in the game, mm -hmm. right? Um, and these are actual systems people can run on the Google platform today. So it's really, it's really heavily gamed, especially since most app discovery relies on only three variables, uh, which is, you know, the rating, the number of reviews, and the time difference and when it happened. Yeah, I was, um, both of you, I mean, in terms of the way that your search works, it relies a lot on what people are actually saying about a place or an app, you know, using social media. So um, I wanted to basically ask you if you could talk about basically, you know, which accounts, how, which accounts or which status, I mean, how do you weight them? Which ones do you know to give priority to? Um, yeah, so, you know, over the last two and a half years, we've actually, um, come to realize that the authority of an account is not a great signal for local interest. And you know, the way our system works is we're constantly trying to apply additional information to our index that we can use in our relevance. And so we're doing a lot of um, analysis on the accounts that we find. And so the first challenge that we've had to solve is how do we actually identify all of the Twitter accounts and Facebook pages and, and join them and deduplicate them and come up with an accurate points of interest database. And that's been a, su a surprisingly difficult problem. But going beyond that, you know, we started with things like business category. So obviously certain business categories are interesting at different times of day. Nightclubs are interesting at night, restaurants in the evening. You know, if someone is, a, is a, an attorney, for example, they're probably going to be interested in what attorneys are sharing nearby. And so the actual business category has been really interesting. But going beyond that, we found things like um, looking at the frequency with which business posts, which, with which business posts, um, you know, we can find lots of places that post the same message continuously. You know, in the United States, we've got an event called Taco Tuesday, where every Tuesday night they serve cheap tacos. And so it's easy, you know, to identify those posts from one account every Tuesday. And so that's obviously not interesting to someone nearby. And then going beyond that, what we've done is we've um, figured out what we call account scope. And so if you think about a Starbucks, 
you know, you wouldn't want to walk around town and always see an update from Starbucks. So we've been able to identify that that is a national or even an, an international account versus something for, you know, the one unique local restaurant. And so we're able to use that as an additional signal. You know, if Starbucks says, you know, you know, anywhere in the city today we're having something that's interesting, then, you know, that might surface. So for us, we're just constantly trying to, you know, process the data, glean more insight. And we found that it's really often not the accounts that you'd expect that drive the best content. You know, it could be the restaurant where the chef is behind the counter and he's just taking a photo and he has five followers. And he's saying, hey, this is what I'm serving tonight. And if you can connect that with people who are nearby and interested, it's this really timely, interesting piece of content. But he's just doing it for his own passion. And so we've really tried to downplay number of followers, you know, uh, amount of content that people have and really focus on the quality of the content itself. So it's been an interesting, you know, to learn about that over the last two and a half years. So kind of, you know, in the same kind of vein, actually, it's very interesting to use Twitter as an example. Uh, one of the first experiments we ran years ago was um, we try to see what do apps actually do versus what do they say and claim that they do. So we actually, uh, we, we ran kind of a, a search on the web of what are all the discussions that people are having about Twitter as a service versus what does Twitter say that they actually do. And it turns out one of the most common phrases that comes out is brand management. And you see this almost everywhere except Twitter, right? So Twitter is describing, you know, was describing themselves as, you know, helping people follow what's going on in your life, in your day. It's a very personal experience. But actually, if you read what's going online, they're saying, yeah, Twitter is a great way for your brand to get managed, for people to know about your business, for people to, uh, you know, for PR, right? And, uh, and we found this complete, you know, misalignment. And it actually, you know, helped for us kind of lead the way to understand that, just because you say your app does something, that doesn't mean that's how people plan on using it, right? And I think that's gonna be true on the world of software, and it's gonna be true in the world of businesses. So. Actually, um, that kind of goes into my next question, which is about digital marketing, because basically, you know, you're talking about venues, a lot of them are small businesses, kind of mom and pop shops, and the developers obviously is a completely different space, but you know, the developers, they're kind of like small business owners too. You know, you spend all this time developing an app and you kind of unleash it into a world where people might or might not find it. Actually about 20% of developers are companies that make over $20 million a year, including Fortune 500s that put out a lot of apps and large games like EA, which puts out, you know, tremendous amount of games. Yeah. But. So is that also, I mean, is that like a challenge? Well, what about the like utter 80%, you know? They I mean, so, so there's a spread, right? I mean, and yeah. I, think, I think there's a misunderstanding of apps, yeah. I mean, in general. Everyone thinks that every app is trying to get every user on earth to use them mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And that's just not true, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, hospitals are now working on putting out apps that help the doctors stay in touch with their current, you know, current clients, right? Yeah. That doesn't mean that they want to have every person on earth using that app mm -hmm. and using it yeah. all the time. I'll give you an example. There are apps that help you buy homes now. Well, you know, they're not expecting you to buy a home every single day, yeah. but they want you, when you do buy that home, to have the best experience, right? So we constantly are measuring apps on the fact that they're on your front screen. You're accessing it every day. You know, you want to mm -hmm. be constantly consuming it, but that's not the reality mm -hmm. of the app ecosystem, yeah. right? And, and you have different players. Sure, you have small businesses, you have consumer apps, you have startups, but you also have Fortune 500s and you have industry. And today those apps are being developed by just about everybody. Apps are just the digital representation of our real world. Yeah, yeah. thanks for bringing that up because it's a really good point about digital marketing is that you're not just trying to get customers, you're trying to get the right customers. Um, and yeah, I, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you in terms of digital marketing. I know Pat, when we were talking earlier, you said, a lot of the venue owners are just completely fatigued. A lot of things haven't worked out for them, like Groupon, for instance. Can you tell me about? Yeah, you know, my experience uh, talking to small businesses in the United States is that, um, you know, they're definitely fatigued from always hearing about the latest and greatest way that they're going to reach customers. Yeah. You know, Groupon came in, uh, you know, 50% discount, 25% of the remainder goes to Groupon. So, you know, some businesses did well, some did not. And so I think, We've really tried to focus on requiring nothing from, from the small business. Mm -hmm. So we do all of the work of going out, identifying their accounts, you know, finding their content, ser servicing it to people nearby. You know, in a dream world for us, you know, we would love to have that chef who posts that photo, you know, connect it with someone walking down the street who's really got an interest, have them walk in and, you know, how'd you hear about us? Oh, I use this app Spindle. And so we would really like to try to show value, you know, to the small businesses, drive customers for them before we, you know, try to make money from them. And I think, 
you know, in general with small businesses, it's really important to think about, you know, are you actually offering them value? I think, especially these days with the media attention on it, you know, and especially, you know, after Groupon living social things like that, there's a really quick cycle. You know, if, if you're perceived as taking advantage of small businesses and not really offering them something great, I think people find out pretty quickly. So yeah. it's an important it's important to approach that pretty carefully. Yeah. Sorry, and Tomer, like for example, like for for example, the apps that don't have like a Fortune 500 company backing them, or the ones that are targeting a specific niche or sector, um, you know, how could potentially? I was wondering in terms of like. How were they trying to get um, users before, and how could QuickSeed potentially change that? Sure. I mean, so we, we've seen everything. We've seen everything from, like, in New York, where um, grocery stores that actually have built apps for the grocery store have actually have a sign, download my app, and here's a QR code. Uh, you know, you see that uh, all the way to, you know, things like AppGratis, that's been very popular recently, um, TapJoy, which was basically a uh, got you downloads but didn't get you engagement. Right, so you know, I think small businesses fall for these traps, you know, left and right in both places. Um, it's tough. I mean, I'll be honest, it's really tough. If you're a you know small app developer trying to get an app out there, you're competing in a world of of a lot of you know difficulty. Um, one, one of the things that we recommend is understand your audience. Don't try to get every user ever. Um, you know, you know, with Quixie today, you know, we are putting together a lot of solutions that not only help you know, users find apps, but we're actually about to release a lot of solutions that help apps find users and identify what are the correct users for them, right, that actually would use the app regularly. And using the app is a, is a goal. So for example, if your goal is just to build an app that's you know, a game versus your goal is that you're that grocery store and you want people to use the app so that they come back and buy more at your grocery store, then you're using the app as a channel, right? Using the app as a marketing piece. In fact, the entire app's purpose is marketing. So you have to kind of understand what the point is and how to use it. And I think we have to start thinking differently. I think we have to start thinking about why are we building apps? What is the purpose of the app? Who are we trying to get to? And what channels can we use to do that? I think Spindle is a great example where, you know, if I'm a restaurant, I'm, I'm not going to just try to make sure that I have the best app. I'm going to make sure I have the best, you know, digital experience, which means I'm going to reach out to a company like Spindle. I'm going to reach out to every company out there that might feature my restaurant, my name, and maybe even get people afterwards to link directly to my app as a regular customer, but use those channels to do so. Um, just to piggyback on what he's saying, so, uh, you know, we are, I don't want to say indie, you know, we've raised two and a half million dollars, but, you know, we are a small company that's trying to acquire um, installs and users. And, you know, one of our early focuses, of course, you know, maybe it's just my own vanity, was, was press. And I think we put a huge emphasis on, you know, we're going to get the big article written, and we're going to get all the coverage. And what we found is that uh, we were really targeting the wrong people. And so we would get these installs, and really what it was was just in the industry, trying out the app, never coming back. And so we had a lot of success um, with Facebook ads, the mobile app install ads, and spending really, really small budgets um, trying to target, you know, different people. And, of course, you find... You know, if your app helps people discover what's happening nearby, if you can target, you know, uh, a single woman in her 20s who frequently eats out in restaurants, that's obviously a much better customer than someone who reads an article. So, I mean, I think this, this problem of trying to acquire customers, um, of course, the press is great, you know, TechCrunch is great. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's better to take, you know, a slower approach and really sort of test and figure out who your audience is. And so it's great if you guys are able to help people figure that out. But... And so we're, um, we have about six minutes left, so I just wanted to ask you, um, what are the key developments do you think will happen in search in the next few years? What are the things that you are most excited about, either within your sector or just you know, in the um, larger search and discovery space? Um, yeah, so I'm obviously excited about mobile, and in particular, you know, context on mobile. And uh, you know, if you think about, like I said earlier, web search and how you've got to come in and construct the query yourself. That's really limited. You know, there's only uh, so many operators that people are going to learn. You can only put so much UI to allow, you know, filters on results and things like that. So I'm really focused on, you know, you pull out your phone. What can you learn about someone? You know, when I walk around, you know, Seoul here for the past few days, I visited the temple, which I think is that way. And, uh, you know, it's fun. I like to stand there and ask myself, you know, what do I want to know about this place right now? And if I were with you, you know, what would, what would you want to know? If we came back tomorrow, how would that change? How can I infer that? And so I think it's really exciting because, you know, mobile devices and the signals that they provide, location, you know, current time, if the person's authenticated on the device, you know, past behavior, 
they really sort of open up an unlimited opportunity to understand where someone is, what they're looking for, and to service results that they haven't even really thought to look for. And then even going beyond that, you know, I think there's a, a really tremendous opportunity to be anticipatory in your results. So Google came out with some stats recently saying that obviously mobile queries are you know, exploding, um, but the vast majority of them still occur when people are at home or at work. And only 17, I think it was 17% of queries on mobile devices happen when people are on the go. And so there's this enormous opportunity to invent new queries, give people really timely you know, and interesting results, but people aren't really doing it. And so what's exciting about you know, mobile devices with background location is it's, it's easy now to track where someone goes, to have a service on the back end that's constantly you know, following where they are, what's happening, what are their interests, and trying to send them push notifications. So we introduced a feature called Spindle Alerts, and you can track you know, a query. You could say wine tasting and just walk around town. And no matter where you go, if you walk by a place that has a wine tasting, we'll send you a push notification. So what we've found is that gives us amazing retention. We have, I think, you know, after three months, people who've done that are almost at 50% week over week retention. And secondly, it um, explains to people what the product does. And so we've talked to people who get these alerts, and now they get it. They go, oh, I rely on this app you know, to tell me when things are happening nearby. Well, of course, right? That's what's in our marketing. No one read our marketing. So, you know, I think mobile, you know, going forward, there's just all these opportunities to, you know, come up with these new queries, to, to ping people at the right time, to interrupt them at the right time. And I just think, um, you know, there's just an endless amount that we can come up with there. So. Tell me what about you? What are you excited about? So actually, two things. I'm only going to give one Quixie example, one non-Quixie example. So on, you know, on the Quixie side, I actually think the interesting thing about the stat you said is two pieces. 17% of queries that Google sees happens when people are on the go. One might argue it's because most people, 83% of the time, are either at home or work. But the other point is actually more and more queries are happening vertically. Right? People are opening up apps and searching there. What I'm excited about is that I don't want to open up apps. Right? I don't want to have to open up a spindle to get spindle. I want to be able to search from a single command line and get access to every app. Right? I know that's what we're working on. It would be very exciting. Uh, just a very simple example. You know, everyone has a computer there. You know, if you guys search for just sine 5x minus 1, you know, a simple math equation, Google gives you their Google answer. And then the rest of the results are blogs, articles. They, they don't even try. Right? If, you're, if I'm on my phone, I should be able to put any equation, any math equation, and it should launch my calculator. I have a calculator. I should be able to access it, right? I should be able to say that I want to go and find a restaurant, and I should see every single app, ones I have, ones I don't, and what their answer is to what are those restaurants, so I can actually browse the different app solutions. I think that's where we're going, right, where we don't actually live by a single app, but we live by the conglomeration of all the apps. Now, that's where we're going. In terms of where I think sort of the industry is going overall and, and where the technology of search is going, I think it's going to have to evolve because we're going to be living in a world very soon where we're not just talking about a few million apps. We're talking about tens or hundreds of millions of apps. You know, as an example, um, I, I live in this new apartment in Mountain View where I access my home not with a key but with my phone. Right? My phone actually finds an app that's my door handle and sends over a confirmation and then my door opens. And I can send other people, like, within this hour to this hour, you have access to my house. Or it can tell me who's gone in and out of my house. Right? The, f the, the second that my door handle is an app is very interesting. Right? The second that my car tells me how much gas is left in it, right? or that my oven is telling me how that chicken is doing. Right? The second that we're living in a world where software is just pervasive through hardware, discovery becomes key and paramount. If we're living in a world where even our own home has 80, 100, 200, you know, 1,000 different small pieces of software running, and each piece of software is putting together tons of data, and each piece of tons of data is interacting with other data, how do we discover what is the best way to utilize our own home, our own workplace, our own car? I think that's where, in the next few years, entrepreneurs are going to have to really you know, think hard about how do we transition our society into sort of a true digital age. OK, and um, have a minute left. Any parting thoughts? <laughs> I, you know, I, I do think one thing, and this is something I actually love about Korea. You know, some of the best software pieces I've seen here have been like from companies kind of like SK with T-Maps and, you know, the T-Store and really solutions that have been Korea first. You know, Kakao and others have really, really led the way to show that, you know, what we believe today is sort of the, this is what we expect from Apple or Google isn't always going to stay the same. 
And I really do believe that the next generation of technologies aren't just going to come from Silicon Valley. I mean, I think it's really going to come from, you know, from Korea, you know, from, you know, Southeast Asia, from Europe, uh, from the Middle East. And I think we're going to see these solutions being created because it's not a one thing fits all, right? I don't think Facebook fits everybody. I think Kakao Talk fits better for most people. I think Message Me Now fits better for Silicon Valley. So I think that's really something that, you know, being in Korea is really encouraging, is to see all the innovation. Yeah, I mean, def yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, no. yeah. Actually, I wanted to ask you, Pat, because I know a lot of the people in the audience are developers, and Korea's startup system is still, startup industry is still very young. Is there any advice or any um, kind of thoughts you want to tell people? Just keep pushing. I mean, uh, I was talking to someone the other day saying, you know, that they had gone to the United States and tried to get traction for their app and had a hard time, and I have a hard time, too. So, you know, seriously, I would just say keep pushing. And on a parting note, since Spindle doesn't work in Korea, everyone should download Mango Plate. It's by Bernard Kim. I met him last night. You've got to download that and use that, so. Okay, great. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you.